Hey, good evening, guys. Happy Sunday. I hope everyone is doing well. Um, we are going to talk about a topic that people have been reaching out to me about, and I think it's finally time we said something on, and that is the Andrew Tate ban. I'm going to pin that topic right there. Um, <clears throat> Andrew Tate ban. So um, we're going to just kind of jump right into this, and this is probably going to be just based on... Um, the kind of comments and questions that I've been receiving about this, this is probably gonna be a series of conversations that we have. But most of you know who Andrew Tate is, and if you don't, you can Google it. I don't wanna go into grave detail about it, but you know, Andrew Tate basically was a professional kickboxer. Um, and then at some point he was on, I think it was 2016, he was on a Big Brother show in 2016. Um, and I think he got kicked off the show for saying some, saying and doing some pretty gnarly things. And so he's not exactly been a, a person with a clean slate to start with. Um, <clears throat> and I just want to, to make a couple of points clear. You know, the reason why I feel compelled to even talk about this now is because uh, there's been a lot of, of sort of questions looming about, you know, is this censorship? Is this, you know, does he have a right to free speech? Are the platforms good in doing this, okay in doing this? Uh, what are the legalities in doing this? Some of those questions we can answer pretty easily. Um, some of those questions are, are sort of deeper questions. And, um, you know, questions of whether at a particular time and place in society, whether that content should be allowed on a platform is an interesting question, right? Because I think it changes um, as societal norms change and as tastes and preferences change. So um, just taking, kind of zooming out for a second and asking the question, I'm not here to answer the question of whether Andrew Tate is right or wrong. I could care less about the guy. I don't know the guy. Uh, I never followed him. I only started paying attention to what was going on when he got banned. I saw some of his content on TikTok, you know, and I had heard of him, but I, I it, it wasn't a big deal, right? I mean, I, I heard some things that was shocking and that, that was it, right? You move on. You see a lot of stuff on social media uh, platforms that are shocking. Anyone who's been on TikTok knows there's a ton of shocking things on YouTube, on Instagram, et cetera, et cetera. So the question of whether he's right or wrong on anything he says is not what I'm here to talk about. I think we can all agree as a point number two that he has said some extremely vile, controversial, disgusting, offensive things. Offensive things about women, offensive things about men, offensive things, period. Uh, he stereotyped people, um, and it's not pleasurable for me to hear what he says in interviews. At the same time, isn't that what social media platforms are designed for? And even if you don't agree with that premise, let me take a step back and say this. Guess what f people find to be entertaining nowadays? Controversial topics, controversial people, controver controversial things. Um, and I view Andrew Tate as an entertainer. I don't take him seriously. Um, I have to laugh at him when he says certain things. Um, sometimes he's comical. Um, I know he said things that are, that he claims are very serious and form his belief, things about, uh, male dominance and masculinity. Uh, and again, I, I have no taste for any of that stuff, but the question is, is Andrew Tate, this part of kind of my analysis and how I view this, is Andrew Tate an entertainer? Is he a professional coach? Should I give him any credibility? And why do I care? Um, but number one thing to kind of keep in mind is controversy sells. It sells on these platforms. It sells on Instagram. It sells on TikTok. Uh, taboo topics sell. When was the last time you saw something on social media, whether it was TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and you looked at it and you said, oh, this is, this is, this is wild. Or even go, go at another step further. This is extreme. This hits me in a weird way. You probably shared it. You probably shared it. You probably commented on it. You may not have liked it using a like button, but you probably shared it with somebody and said, hey, have you seen this? This is wild. Do you think Andrew Tate doesn't know that? Do you think Andrew Tate didn't by design know that he was going to get to a peak of a bubble that was going to pop? Of course he did. A 100% he did. And I believe it was all calculated and, and that he didn't, he didn't care. He didn't care that he was being banned in that sense. Um, he made a lot of money doing other things. Um, those of you who don't know, from what I've heard on interviews 
Andrew Tate self-proclaims that he has made money by hiring a bunch of women to do, uh, I don't know if it's cam work or if it's actually like sexting or if it's leading men on a ruse and rich men and taking their money, but he made a ton of money doing that uh, or a combination of that stuff. And he's talked about this in interviews and I've heard him say it himself. This is not something I've read about what somebody said about him. This is coming from him. So already not a guy with a clean slate as far as I'm concerned. But that's not really the issue, is it? Right? The, the problem that I have here is social media being guilty, social media platforms being guilty of doublespeak. What do I mean by that? When something is controversial, when something is getting a lot of eyeballs, which controversy does, whether you like it or not, whether you agree with it or not, the platforms reward the content creators for that, don't they? The, the algorithms, when something is viral, how does it get viral? It just doesn't just get published and millions of people see it. What happens is it starts trending. It has to get, there's an initial spark. The initial spark is created by people's intrigue. And in the past, I would say two to three years, uh, certainly controversy is always sold. But in the past two or three years, the algorithms, particularly TikTok, is guilty of pushing content that even if it's extreme, even if it is vile content, it goes it goes viral very quickly. It gets shared. It gets liked. Perhaps eventually it gets taken down for violating some policy. But no one can debate fairly that these content platforms reward controversy with more of that content. The algorithms are designed that way. So people who then watch Andrew Tate, who've seen him on these 30 second or one minute clips uh, on TikTok, they see him say something disgusting and vile about women or about, about masculinity or whatever he talks about. What happens? You watch the whole clip. What comes up in your discovery? In, in the discovery part of your TikTok, more of that content. You don't watch one of those videos and then Instagram, you know, TikTok sends you cat videos, right? By design, that platform is going to feed you more of Andrew Tate. So my problem going back to this situation is I don't like the double speak where platforms say, this is against our rules. We're gonna police this. It seems to me that all social media platforms, particularly TikTok, but also YouTube, reward eyeballs, reward the likes, comments, and shares. And it gets to a point, the content gets to a point where then it may hit some nerves and may hit a lot of nerves. And then there's a point at which the public hears about it and organizations, individuals, people who know what they're doing, bring this to light. Media gets involved and now there's pressure on the platforms. Pressure works. Pressure on these platforms works. They don't want to be seen as the bad guys. And we all know that the platforms take the position that just because it's on our platform doesn't mean we agree with it, right? This is what Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act is all about. It's about these are this is user generated content. We don't endorse the content. Uh, in fact, we have no liability for the content. And yet, and yet, when the platforms feel pressure, societal pressure, or pressure by particular groups, they then point to or create a basis in their terms to actually police it. My experience being an internet lawyer, an e-commerce lawyer, um, particularly taking down defamatory content or helping people keep content up that's subject to the First Amendment, what I have found is every single platform is guilty of doublespeak. None of them respond the way you would think when there is vile content about an individual or a company, perhaps even completely false and outrageous content that's damaging, none of them want to respond by taking it down. Guess why? Because they are not rewarded by removing content. Whether it's great content, vile content, controversial content, Andrew Tate, etc. They don't win when that comes down. You know what they win with? They win with winning public's favoritism. They win by saying, we did the right thing and we removed this guy or gal or subject or channel. This is what I have a problem with. So I'm zooming way out from Andrew Tate for a second. Again, like I said, I, I don't know the guy. I don't follow him. I've seen his videos. I've watched it. I get why people, a lot of people don't like what he has to say. 100% understand it. That needs no justification. What I don't like 
And as an internet lawyer, what I find problematic is double speak. If you are not afraid of liability platforms, if your position is user generated content, if your position is we have these terms and we enforce them equally as to all content creators, you are guilty of double speak. You are not conveying to the public what in fact you do. And as a matter of fact, we do know this about YouTube. About five or six years ago, YouTube made a significant change in their algorithm uh, after many, many, many people complained that upon viewing extremist content because of research or they were created and watching, statistically, they were shown, they were 70 to 75% more likely to view more extremist content. We have the data that you can just Google and, and learn about YouTube's change in algorithm in response to white nationalism and extremism. YouTube would push the content. They would. That's what they did. Because again, their money-making scheme, YouTube and Google, and really any content pl platform, is getting more eyeballs, running advertising, making it addictive, making it viral. That's how they make dough. Everybody knows that. YouTube ended up making a significant change to the algorithm in around 2017 related to white nationalism and extremist content. Because people brought to light the fact they were more likely, again, I think it's you're about 75% more likely to see the, an, a more extremist content as a result of watching one extreme video on YouTube. That's telling. So YouTube said, we're going to do the right thing and we're going to you know, tweak our algorithm so that we push down the content that is extreme and violative. Which begs the next question. Is that censorship? Do we as a society want the platforms to decide what we can and can't watch? I'm not arguing that they don't have a right to take it down. I think that's a losing argument. And let me make this clear. As a lawyer, I know that these private companies have contractual terms as users that you sign up to, which say that you will not post or that we will not tolerate as a platform certain kinds of content, obscene content, content that is, um, you know, that promotes violence and hate speech um, or, you know, violence towards particular groups. These are common terms in many of these social media platforms. They have every right to take down whatever content that they want. They are not a governmental entity in the United States. The First Amendment does not protect you and I or anyone else from the deletion of their content off of any of these platforms. That's 100% clear. There is no good argument there. The question of whether they should or not is a different question. Again, I look at it as I have a problem getting down offensive content for clients all the time. Sometimes it's leaked content. It's sometimes infringing content. Um, sometimes it's defamatory content. These platforms don't respond like they should. I have a problem with that. So I find it quite convenient that when certain kinds of content in the opinion of certain people and groups, when they put on the pressure valve that the platforms respond in the way they do. Because we've all flagged videos that were legitimately obscene, legitimately offensive, and the platforms don't seem to take them down most of the time. And I don't know if there is a, a, a magic number at which they actually decide to take action, but I have a problem with doublespeak. The other thing we gotta understand is today, um, not unlike history, when it comes to content, people respond to extreme um, and controversial content by watching it. That's what they do. I'm going to use an example of Howard Stern. Howard Stern, at one point, was the most fined radio host by the FCC, by the Federal Communications Commission. Around the same time that he was the most fined radio host, I think he's paid you know, over $2.5 million, or at least was fined over $2.5 million dollars, for content that was indecent, he also executed one of the most significant uh, radio contracts with Sirius, I think it was in 2004 or five, somebody can check me on that, for like $500 million. This is way before podcasting and, and Spotify and Joe Rogan. So what's my point? On one hand, society, we view it, at, we, view, we viewed him, Howard Stern specifically, to make an analogy, as controversial. We viewed him as indecent, and somebody that's not worthy of being heard, fine, 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 get him off the radio, and then boom, Sirius paid him $500 million was his overall contract for five years. One of the most successful radio contracts, period. How, how do we square that? Clearly, people are listening to him. 
or were listening to him. Clearly, he was successful. I don't think Andrew Tate is far off from that. Again, I don't have I don't need to take a position on whether he's crazy or he you know the things he says are extreme. I don't like a lot of what he has to say, but I don't care. That's not the point. People watch him. People have been listening to him. The algorithms rewarded him with exactly what the algorithms reward every person that's watching this video. If it's if it's watched, if it's liked, if it's shared, it's going to get a spike. I have a problem with, as I already said, platforms treating uh, different content creators differently, flagging and, and taking and banning things um, inconsistently. You can find many, 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 many channels on Instagram that promote hate, violence, extremist beliefs towards African Americans right now. You can go and you can find them. Maybe they weren't as possible. Maybe the argument is the platform simply haven't caught the content. I doubt it. Um, but it seems like there's a certain public pressure valve that has to turn on before these platforms do anything. It's not content moderation in its truest sense. It's pressure. They respond to pressure. Um, that's the high level conversation that I wanted to have. You know, this is probably going to be a series of conversations about uh, content moderation. What kind of content deserves to be taken down or deserves to stay up? Personally, I have a problem with a lot a lot of content that I see on um, on TikTok especially that is extremely offensive. Does that mean that it should just be banned? I don't know. I don't have a great answer to that. Um, there's content that is, I mean, I have a problem watching Real Housewives. I think a lot of that is, is demeaning and degrading to women. Sells really well, apparently. Um, so bottom line, uh, I think on the question of Andrew Tate, there's no question he's said some pretty horrendous things, egregious things. I haven't watched enough of his stuff to know if it's consistent, but in the hour or two of stuff that I've seen, I've heard enough to know that I get it. I get why people would not like things that he has to say. But the question is not whether he's right or wrong about those things. The question is, are these platforms targeting him for a reason? Are they targeting their po are, are they targeting content creators for violations of their policies equally across the board? Definitely not. Definitely not. They seem to be responding to public pressure. I have a problem with that. I guess the future question is, should people like Andrew Tate be banned at all? I mean, is it that extreme? That's a decision, I guess, that you guys have to make. Um, you can complain about it. Viewers complain about content all the time. Um, somebody said it's politics. I agree. Politics plays a lot with this, right? The Capitol riot stuff. Look at how... The amount of content that is pro capital riots to pro take down, you know, take over this country and, and turn the United States of America back to a certain form and certain, uh, you know, political realm, right or wrong, there is a ton of content on that. That is extreme. Okay. The FBI produced a report. There have been multiple presentations before the Senate Judiciary Committee on extremism and terrorism to, dem to demonstrate, okay, with numbers that um, extremist white nationalism is a, a type of terrorism and is a type of violence that is prevalent. And it is, you know, it, it's bringing in people and eyeballs um, and is going viral and that it's extremely concerning at an alarming rate. This is a few years ago. It's continued. Is that stuff being taken down? Apparently they find Andrew Tate more offensive than that. I have a problem with that. I have a problem with that. I have a problem with all racist ideologies, okay? Um, for some reason they get a free pass. So anyway, this is just kind of kicking off the conversation. Uh, many of you who are watching are probably going to at some point make some comments about this, send us DMs. Your comments are all welcome. You don't have to agree with me. That's part of what I love about social media is we can have this debate. I think debate and controversy, ultimately good things come out of it because it forces us to ask questions that are difficult to ask, that are uncomfortable to talk about. Um, and sometimes the best way for those things to come about is through controversial figures coming out and stirring up controversy. That's it. Um, but I'm curious to hear what everyone's thoughts are. Uh, please comment, send us your direct messages if you, if you have a question. 
and we'll definitely be um, talking about uh, cancel culture and Andrew Tate, um, the platforms taking and deleting content more. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Again, if you're just joining the live, um, the question of whether it's, you know, Andrew Tate is right or wrong is really not in my mind as an internet lawyer, what's on the forefront of this discussion. His content is offensive, it's controversial. The question is, are these content platforms actually enforcing their policies equally? The question is, why are they allowing other extreme, violent uh, content that is actually having real life implications to persist? And yet they find Andrew Tate to be so offensive that he has to be banned on all these platforms. It's a response to pressure, that's my point. Um, thank you guys for joining us again. Uh, let me know what else you want to hear, what else you want to talk about and send me your comments until next time. Thanks guys.